Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar today, uh, hosted by Food IQ Global, or you might have previously known us as Nutrition Research Australia when you did register for this webinar. Uh, so welcome to this webinar and to our new brand, Food IQ Global. Today, uh, our webinar is called Berries as a Powerful Solution to Support Gut and Brain Health. Perspectives from a Researcher, Dietitian, and a Naturopath. Today's session is uh, funded by Hort Innovation. I'm Dr. Emma Beckett. I am uh, I work for Food IQ Global. Uh, today is funded by Hort Innovation, as I said, uh, using the Blackberry, Blueberry and Raspberry research and development levies and contributions from the Australian government. Hort Innovation, if you don't know, is a grower-owned, not-for-profit research and development corporation for Australian horticulture. Today, our webinar might be slightly different than the formats you typically see. We will be using a more a fireside chat format to our presentation, where all three speakers will be speaking uh, back and forth throughout the presentation. So I hope you find that pleasant and engaging. We will do question time after our presentation. Uh, so please do put your questions into the Q&A box at any time throughout the session. You can also upvote a question if you want to ask the same question as someone else has already posted, or if you see a question and think that's a great idea, you'd love to hear the answer, please do press the upvote button next to that, that question in the Q&A box anytime throughout the session. So I would now like to introduce you to our wonderful panel for today. So rather than me introduce them all in very long format, I will introduce them all to say that we have three wonderful humans and three wonderful speakers. Uh, and these people are from a diversity of backgrounds in the food and nutrition science space. Um, so I hope they can deliver a lovely difference and synergy in perspectives on our topic today. So what I would like to do rather than me rabbit on is ask each of our presenters to introduce themselves in their own words in turn and we'll obviously go on the order we have on the slide. So go ahead please Nanad. Thanks very much Emma and uh, thanks very much guys for inviting me to present uh, here today. Um, it's on, on this uh, really dear topic to my heart of uh, not only from the food perspective but also from the research perspective as well. So uh, my name is Nana Nowowski. I'm uh, a chef by trade. Uh, I'm a food scientist and molecular nutritionist. And I work at uh, University of Canberra as a professor in food science and human nutrition. Um, and in particular, we look, um, the, one of the areas of my work is looking at um, plant bioactives and their effects on psychological and cardiometabolic risk factors. Um, so I'll leave it as that, and I'll pass it over to Nicole. Trick for new players. <laughs> Thanks, Ninad. My name is Nicole Dine, and very happy to be here today. I'm an accredited practicing dietitian, an accredited sports dietitian, and the founder and director of the Gut Health Dietitian. Um, I do guest lecture at the University of Sydney and I'm, I'm, I'm a media spokesperson for the Dietitians uh, or Dietitians Australia, as they're now called, and an avid berry lover. Um, so my team really specialise in nourishing the gut health of our clients through our private practice brand, which is the Gut Health Dietitian, as well as via our corporate nutrition services and sister company, the Good Nutrition Co., um, which really just allows us to reach and help more people. Um, so I'm very excited to be here today and I will pass over to Teresa. Hi everyone, it's great to be here today um, and thank you Nicole because Nicole, um, like yourself, I'm a berry lover so I'm really enjoying, I enjoyed uh, looking at the research for berries and particularly blueberries. So I'm a senior lecturer at Torrens University and my main lecturing area is uh, preclinical studies and also supervising the clinical nutritionists and naturopaths at Torrens University. I'm also in clinical practice as a naturopath and a clinical nutritionist. And I volunteer some of my time for the media for Bowel Cancer Australia. And um, yes, I can't wait to get started. Wonderful. Thank you, all of you. Um, 
I'm really thrilled to have you all here and it is such a diversity of knowledge that we have here today. Nicole, I do notice you are dressed as a little blueberry for me today, which I appreciate. Um, and if you can't see on the Zoom at home, I do have my blackberry earrings on as well as my raspberry dress. Um, and each of our panellists is a different berry uh, in their background today, which I absolutely love because diversity is my favourite thing. Um, so let's get going uh, with our content for today. So we're going to start um, quite simple. Um, and I would like to hear from each speaker from your both your personal and your professional point of view as to why you think berries are important and why you felt berries were important to come here and talk about today. Uh, so I'm going to start with Nanad um, and you get to do the introduction uh, to berries as well as your own take. Um. Thanks very much, Emma. Well, uh, berries are, from, from my take, the berries are one of the, probably the most important um, um, fruits that you will actually find um, for a number of different reasons. One of them is that they're relatively easy to grow, especially, especially the wild berries, and, and you'll find them um, in, in a rather diverse landscapes and rather diverse uh, uh, regions. Um, and um, I, I remember and berries always used to play an important concept in me growing up, um, not only from the food consumption perspective, but also from um, a, a nourishing perspective, because they were relatively easy to be found, uh, particularly growing up in, in the Dalmatia in, in former Yugoslavia. Now, when you talk about the berries, berries are really interesting because botanically, berries are defined as a fleshy fruit that is produced from a single ovary. And this definition excludes the strawberries and raspberries, but in these presentations, we will also focus on the fruits commonly considered as a berries. And that includes those from a genre of rubus, such as raspberries, uh, vaccinium, blueberries, fragaria, strawberries, ripes, black currants. But what is also important is that despite the fitting to the botanical definition of the berries, uh, grapes, we are not including them in detail here, but it is also important to know that these also have their uh, impact on the human health and the gut microbiota, but that has been described and reviewed in several different other papers. But because of their reported health properties, the use of berries and berries extract as ingredients in a functional foods is currently an explosion in a growing market. And this increasing interest um, of the impact of the berries on health is uh, mainly due to their rich content in bioactive molecules. Um, now, when we talk about the bioactive molecules, the consumption of fruits and vegetables uh, is a part of diet recommendations for a healthy diet and adhering to different dietary patterns from the contribution from the minerals, um, vitamins, uh, phytochemicals that they provide to the body. And several epidemiological and clinical studies have demonstrated that this regular consumption of uh, fruits and vegetables lowers the risk of developing a number of uh, different health issues, such as uh, cancers, cardiovascular disease, obesity. And there's also um, evident in the population-based studies with a higher adherence to these healthier dietary patterns, such as a Mediterranean diet or a Japanese diet, um, it's predominant. And uh, some of the clinical trials have also conducted by putting a treatment groups on these dietary patterns have also shown the improvements um, in several other health outcomes. And the mechanisms of action have been improved by two main uh, factors, such as the antioxidative and the anti-inflammatory properties. And we will get into detail of all of those uh, coming up. Um, so, Teresa, uh, I'd love if you could tell us a little bit about uh, why you think berries are important, um, and particularly as part of that food-first approach um, as a naturopath. Yes, thanks for mentioning that food-first approach. I think in... In our particular world, we, we're looking at, um, and particularly when we go to health food shops, we're looking at putting everything into a vitamin pill. And uh, that's all well and good, but it doesn't actually take over from making sure that we have a really healthy diet. And as Hippocrates said many years ago, let food be your medicine. And I really do believe that you have to have a great foundation of your diet first before you think about looking at supplementing with various different um, vitamins and minerals or even herbs. So the, the tenets of, of health are actually making sure that the diet is diverse and blueberries fit into that, of course, and all of the berries do, and the different types of vegetables uh, that uh, Ninad was talking about as well that contain the polyphenols. 
Um, and we do know that in our Australian population, there's only 5% of us that actually get enough fruit and vegetables. So that's quite telling about how we prepare our meals and what we do. So if there's one thing that you take away from this today, just make sure that you increase your intake of fruit and vegetables, but particularly the berries, which we're going to talk about. Um, and also looking at whole unprocessed foods. Now, I'm going to talk about some other ways of looking at berries and, and consuming berries, but I really do think that we need to do most of our shopping on the outside of the shopping aisles where we've got our fruit and vegetables. That should take up the majority of your uh, shopping basket to ensure that uh, you're going to get all those lovely nutrients. Um, unprocessed, of course, um, and organic where possible, but uh, not always. Not everybody can afford to get organics and um, a balanced nutritional approach to food as medicine. And of course, we're going to talk about individualized diets. We're going to have a little bit of a look at FODMAP in terms of uh, berries as we go through the presentation. So food as medicine, food first. I love that as a concept. Thank you, Teresa. Um, so Nicole, uh, I know that you are a berry lover and I think this might be you here looking like a little berry. Tell us more. I keep forgetting the mute. Um, yeah, so why berries for me? Well, I guess every picture tells a story. Um, and I've been dressing as a berry since a very young age. <laughs> so that's me on the right. Um, but I'd love to say I was your inspiration, Emma, but I really probably can't take the credit for that. Um, but in all honesty, um, you know, I had a great role model in my mum. So she had this huge edible garden when we were growing up and it had blueberry bushes, it had a strawberry patch. And so we were always, you know, in, in the garden and eating lots of berries. And whilst I am partial to blueberries, so kind of funny, I ended up with the blueberry um, slide today. Um, all berries are highly nutritious. Um, so they're all very rich in fiber, which we're going to talk about today and bioactives. And I think it's really important, um, another key message to take away today when you're working with clients is to encourage them to include all of the berries in their diet as they all offer unique nutritional benefits. So just a quick whiz through those. So strawberries are our vitamin C superstar. Blueberries pack that polyphenol punch, which we're going to elaborate on in a moment. Raspberries, we consider our nutrient all-rounder because they are a source of five key nutrients in good levels. And blackberry is our big boss. So it's the highest in fiber, in vitamin E and magnesium. So they all um, have something to offer, absolutely. Um, and I think back to you now, Emma, I'm going to talk. Thank you. Um, so I do want you to elaborate a bit more on that polyphenol punch, Nicole, because I think most people who come to a webinar like this are already across the basic nutrients in the berries. But the polyphenols and understanding the importance of the polyphenols is probably something that's a little bit more news uh, and really might help people advance their use of berries um, in their lives and in their practice. Whoops. Here we go. Awesome. Please. Thank you. Yeah, so polyphenols are the main types of bioactives, which are sort of health-promoting non-nutrient compounds in plant food. So as you can see below there, um, all plants contain some level of polyphenols, and they are things that contribute to the colour, the flavour, the smell, the antioxidants, the anti-inflammatory components of plant foods. And a bit of a fun fact, they are, whilst they're super good for humans, they're actually... Um, developed in the plant to help protect it from environmental stresses like um, pathogens and pests and that sort of thing. So the, the smell of them actually deters pests. Um, so that's one of the reasons um, organic produce um, can be so, you know, so beneficial because it actually has a higher polyphenol content because it has to protect itself more. It doesn't have the, the help of pesticides and things like that. 
And berries are a major food source of polyphenols. So they're the highest source of polyphenols per serve. So you can see there on the top line on the right-hand side, blueberries are clearly the winner, um, but followed closely by some other foods that we love like coffee and dark chocolate, tea, rye bread, and I think wine would probably come in next after that as well. Notably, all foods that would go well with berries as well. So <laughs> maybe combinations to be encouraged. Yeah. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, Nanad, it's your job now to give us a little bit more of the details of the uh, technical background, I guess, and the molecular nature of the polyphenols, please. Great. Well, thanks. And, uh, sorry. And as Nicole has said, the polyphenols, they are uh, uh, secondary plant metabolites and they don't necessarily contribute to the nutritional um, a benefit of the plant itself, but they actually protect the plant um, from a, a number of a different uh, stressors, uh, and they can uh, act in against the against the disease. Even some of the insects, when they are consuming them, they can actually uh, accelerate the, their reproductive cycle, and insects die off. Um, so they've got a number of a different um, uh, functions within the plant. Um, and when we talk about the polyphenols, um, what I always find it interesting is when you talk to the young and aspiring researchers and you ask them, what are you working on? What is your point of a research? They said, well, I work on a polyphenols. Um, and to me, it's always a mind boggling because there's over 8,000 different compounds that have been identified um, and they fall under that category of, of, of polyphenols. And they have got... Um, you know, very beautiful and simple structures, uh, simple molecules such as, uh, you know, resveratrol, uh, that is one of the polyphenols that is commonly found in a, in, a, in a wine and associated with a number of beneficial health effects such as expanding a, a, a cell life or um, it has been associated with, uh, you know, reduction of a cardiovascular disease or anything like that. But it also has got that the polyphenols also have got these very complex structures, such as the one that you can see um, of a tannic acid. Um, it has got a, quite a lot of a different groups being stacked out and, 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 and quite a diversity of polyphenolic structures. Um, and uh, um, when we try to classify them um, just based on their uh, uh, functional group properties, you can actually see that the majority of the polyphenols can actually be divided based on, on, on a several different groups and the main categories of the polyphenols uh, that are of particular interest in the berries are actually highlighted in, in, in this uh, arranged circle. Um, now, from the structural perspective, from polyphenols, we have got phenolic acid, allergic acids, so and we've got then uh, flavonoids, and that is where majority of the um, uh, polyphenols benefits that we are seeing in these berries are actually arising, such as anthocyanins, uh, flavanols, uh, flavonoids, uh, proanthocyanins, etc. But all of them are very, very complex structures. And what is of uh, most important interest is that you cannot look at a polyphenol category as the individual category that is reserved for a specific fruit or a berry. You also have to take into account that they are found in combination with each other. Uh, rather than being specifically selected for that berry itself. So when we talk about uh, uh, blueberries, we're going to find the anthocyanins, we're going to find the proanthocyanins, but we're also going to find some of the allergic acids, phenolic acids, and a number of different combinations of these uh, grow products. So um, it's really to, uh, important to have that open mind um, sort of a thing when we talk about the polyphenols, it doesn't matter how complex they are. Um, another thing is that from the berries perspective, um, as mentioned, um, much of the literature is orientated towards the anthocyanins and proanthocyanins. And these compounds are well represented in the food products. Now, are they well represented in a diet? Um, not so. Um, because of the lower intake of, of these type of uh, uh, foods. And um, as Teresa has identified, there is only a, a limited amount of, um, of the foods that uh, Australian consumer is actually having, uh, particularly from the fruit and vegetable perspective. But even at uh, small levels, even of um, uh, 15 milligrams per day, there are some indications uh, identified that they can actually pose a beneficial uh, health effects if the people are adhering to the overall healthy dietary patterns. Now, a wide number of studies have focused on preventive effects of berries toward a cardiovascular disease. 
um, such as strawberries and their um, content and the black currants as well are also being investigated for the anti-inflammatory and immunomodulatory, immunomodulatory properties. Um, but um, more recently, there is a number of studies that are actually exploring the antioxidant properties and the anti-cancer effects of the berries. And what is of great interest is that the consumption of all berries, whether the individual berries or a combination of berries, pauses the improvements by the antioxidant pathway, such as removal of free radicals or suppression of the generation of the free radicals, or they have got a protective pathways such as the suppression of the DNA damage, lipid peroxidation, and a protein degradation. So what I'm hearing already is a very strong message of diversity and not stressing so much about the details because there is a diversity. And I think what's wonderful there, um, there's lots of details that are known and lots of ways we can break down the functions and the categories, uh, but we can really, in practice, concern ourselves as much or as little as we like, uh, depending on the context that we need for each of those functions. So that's quite reassuring uh, for me as a human, uh, as well as interesting for me as a scientist. Uh, so thank you, Nanad. Uh, Teresa, um, you have some details to share with us now uh, about some particular um, polyphenols um, and bioactives in, in berries. Yes, and I think it's a really important part that um, Nanad brought in because um, what we're finding on in health food shops is sometimes a, a specific polyphenol is isolated to have a particular health benefit. And um, as Nanad pointed out, that's not necessarily the case. We need to have a variety, a diversity of the different polyphenols in order to get that health benefit. Um, so what uh, most of the research is based on is a particular type of blueberry, which is the Montgomery um, blueberry. Um, and that's found in the United States. But um, what we can do is we can translate that evidence across to the blueberries that we grow in Australia, which is particularly the northern high bush and the southern high bush and the rabbit eye. And it, it can translate across to the Australian vir um, varietals because the main polyphenol anthocyanidin is found in the skin. So that's also where the fibre is, and that's part of the benefit of Australian blueberries is the fibre. And we're going to talk a little bit more about how that affects the gut and the benefits of the fibre from the uh, berries in the gastrointestinal tract. The polyphenols themselves are absorbed in the upper gastrointestinal tract, and they work very well in the lower gastrointestinal tract. So that's just something to bear in mind if we have any patients that um, perhaps have some kind of disorders in the upper or the lower gastrointestinal tract. Um, and we do note that in an acute dose, so when somebody consumes blueberries, the uh, polyphenol metabolites um, are absorbed fairly rapidly and go into our systems quite quickly. So that can be measured and we can see the benefits quite um, rapidly. Wonderful. And that is such a great segue to what we are going to talk about next, which is berries for gut health. And we'll come back to Teresa shortly. Uh, but uh, Nicole, as the gut health dietitian, I'd like to give you the first word on this. Thanks, Emma. Um, well, we know that berries have been positively associated with some microbes that have been linked to health and longevity, which is really exciting. So species such as bifidobacterium and lactobacillus. Um, and we think it really comes down to that prebiotic effect of the polyphenols in berries that's, you know, having this effect. So um, there's two studies being shown here, one that used freeze-dried strawberries and another one that used a blueberry drink. And both showed favourable changes um, in species of gut bacteria within four to six weeks within the gut. So I thought that was pretty exciting. And moving on to the next slide as well. So Teresa mentioned fibre in berries, and it maybe is something that we um, you know, haven't typically associated with fibre. Maybe 
you know, we've associated things like whole grains more with fiber over over the years. Um, but it's really great to consider the fiber content of berries as well, because it really adds um, the diversity of fibers in berries really adds to part of their goodness story. So if we we get down to reality and talk about, you know, a slice of whole grain bread, so that's one serve of wholemeal bread that has three grams of fiber. But when we look at berries, so strawberries have 3.8 grams, um, blueberries have 5.3 grams, raspberries have 8.4 grams, and Big Boss has 9.2 grams. So they're really high in fiber and they've got a great combination of fiber in them as well. So the insoluble fiber across the board really to helps with helps with the regularity of bowel movements. It also helps the ecosystem in the gut because it houses microbes, even if it's not necessarily feeding them. Then the soluble pectin fiber, which helps um, in many ways to regulate the composition of the microbes, intestinal permeability, reducing intestinal inflammation. And then strawberries and blueberries have some of the extra soluble fiber in FOS, the fructooligosaccharides which um, has been shown to um, help with digestive issues like constipation and diarrhea. And then raspberries and blackberries um, have that extra soluble fiber in inulin, which is really a great prebiotic um, you know, uh, type of fiber, which helps to influence the microbiome and um, produce short chain fatty acids. We also just put in the sugar content because working in private practice on many, many occasions, we see patients coming in who are simply um, eating berries as their only fruit because they've heard that they're low in sugar. So you can see that they are reasonably low there compared to other fruits. They're also very, um, you know, low carb, obviously, low energy, low GI, low um, glycemic load as well, and very satiating as a result. So the perfect choice for a lot of people. It's one of my absolutely favorite food science things that the esters that are part of the berries make them taste so much sweeter than their actual sugar content and obviously a beautiful balance there with the fiber. Yeah. So thank you. You've made me feel very good about my berry eating obsession, Nicole. Um, Teresa, I'd love if you could extend upon that, please. Yes. Yeah, so talking about the fiber, the fiber itself helps to modulate the gut microbiota. So what it actually does is helps the um, non-pathogenic bacteria outcrowd the pathogenic bacteria. So that's very beneficial in gut health and particularly certain types of um, gut diseases and uh, gut syndromes. Um, and one of the benefits of the polyphenols is its anti-inflammatory factor. Of course, we've been talking about that, and that helps to restore the colonic epithelial mucus layer. And um, Nicole was talking about the short chain fatty acids. And I, I like to talk about the short chain fatty acids because a, a lot of my patients say to me, what does that actually mean? And really what we're talking about with the short chain fatty acid is this mucus layer that allows the fecal matter, and I'm sorry to get so graphic with everybody, but it allows the fecal matter to sort of flip down the tube, if you would, <laughs> if you like, um, and therefore that creates a, a better bowel motion. Um, and... Um, Nicole was also talking about fiber and what they uh, discovered in some areas of uh, research is that the fiber in the blueberries was very beneficial for diabetic patients um, and that it um, helped to reduce the gut dysbiosis in diabetic patients. So not only has it the benefit of reducing blood glucose levels because of the fiber content, but it also helps with um, the diversity of the um, gut bacteria. Um, and it doesn't increase um, glucose levels and it improves insulin sensitivity. So that's something that we need to bear in mind when we're helping our diabetic patients. 
the uh, ratio of the pharmacutes to ba uh, bacteroides in the gut has been demonstrated to be improved by berry intake. Um, and that corresponds with gut uh, microbiome variability. It's an interesting fact that the gut microbiome uh, variability has decreased over the last, let's say, 50 years. So 50 years ago, we had much more of a diverse landscape than we have today. So consuming berries will help us to get that landscape a little more um, in balance. And you can see from the little diagram there that um, berries can help improve gastric health by increasing motility, um, by helping healthy gut microbes, and also to make us feel fuller for longer because of the um, fiber in the diet. The anti-inflammatory uh, part of the polyphenols um, helps to modulate all of the neuropeptides. So the, the nervous system in the gut, and that can help us with certain diseases like irritable bowel syndrome um, and inflammatory bowel disease, and also um, some benefits to uh, patients who are going through the cancer journey. Wonderful, thank you. And what I'm hearing from you both is a very whole body as well as whole food and whole berry approach, um, which I think is great. Um, so Nanad, uh, if you can extend upon why the gut matters to all of the rest of the body, that would be wonderful. Well, thanks, Emma. Just before I start with that, you had mentioned earlier something about, and if I can just go, uh, about the esters in the berries mm. and um, uh, an enhancement of the flavors. And um, uh, relatively recently, I was only um, a few weeks ago reading an actually a study where uh, they have used the um, esters uh, from the berries in order to enhance the perception of sweetness of some of the uh, of food products that they have been delivering. And uh, uh, quite a large research facility in in France, in, in Lyon, they actually have got the whole establishment sorted out for a different uh, flavor perceptions. What I have found out that um, some of the uh, raspberries esters can actually increase the perception of a sweetness of a standardized glucose, uh, standardized sugar uh, drink by up to two times. Um, in in the participants that um, obviously you know properly ran double blind placebo controlled studies, so even the smell can actually increase that perception of the sweetness, which is also associated with um, potentially lower sugar consumption. Now, when we talk about the gut, gut health system, uh, you know the gut microflora and gut microbiota. What is of uh, from the scientific perspective interest is that actually there is a no clear definition of what a healthy gut microbiota is. Or how does it look like? So we strictly related that to the diversity that is found in the gut microbiota and the diversity of microbial species that live in, a, in, in individuals' gut microbiota, individuals' organism, and they are really related um, on an individual basis. Um, but gut microflora is actually able to metabolize a number of different polyphenols and anthocyanins, but a conversion of these larger polyphenols to phenolic acids, which are much, much smaller uh, compounds, much smaller um, uh, uh, structures, and they have got uh, a similar anti-inflammatory effect as a parent compound. In addition, the smaller compounds and phenolic acids and other anthocyanin metabolites, they actually can possess uh, a greater chemical and microbial stability. Uh, and that can suggest that they might have an important role in antioxidant and physiological effects that we are seeing in many of different studies. Um, only until a few years ago, um, the gut health was considered as a special issue that is not re really related to the overall functioning of the other organ systems. And only in the past 15 to 20 to 25 years, we have seen an absolute explosion of interest uh, that relates to the overall gut health. And consequently, this creates the interest in the effects onto the other systems. 
Now what we are seeing is we are seeing a two-way relationship between the gut and the brain, uh, between the gut and the liver, gut and the muscle, gut and other tissues and organs. Because of these metabolites that are circulating through the systemic circulation that are able to be found in a number of the different tissues. So when you're thinking about a circular, circulatory system, it reaches all parts of your body. So these metabolites might be delivered to a number of the different uh, parts of the body or to a different tissues. And in order to have an effect on the neuronal system, these metabolites can actually pass the blood-brain barrier and influence um, by neuroprotective effect, influence the development and, and the beneficial health outcomes that we are seeing from neurological sides. I'm going to let you roll straight into berries for brain health, Nanad, because you're absolutely heading there already. So No, <laughs> no worries at all. Um, and when we talk about the berries, um, I was also reading this morning, actually, um, uh, through my um, a, a very uh, a valid source of the scientific information. I found it on the Twitter. Uh, it was an article that has actually been talking about importance of the gut role on the sleep quality and very much unexplored relationship between the sleep and the gut and what kind of effects that might have. Um, um, but when we think about cognitive decline, the cognitive actually decline develops over many years, um, uh, unless there is a specific genetic predisposition for development of a very sharp and accelerated cognitive decline. And the long-term dietary habits are the most likely relevant to the brain health. Now, a study by Elizabeth DeVore and a colleagues that was published back in 2012 looked at the long-term intake of a berries and overall and flavonoids and their association with the rates of cognitive decline in older women um, of the Nurses' Health Study. And in this study, they retrospectively examined the dietary intake of over 16,000 participants from 1980s all the way up to 2001. And they performed a number of different cognitive battery tests. Um, I think that they used over six uh, tests that were performed. Um, and participants' dietary intake, they used, uh, they determined by the food frequency questionnaire. Now, what is really important is that the findings of this study have indicated that the higher consumption of berries and anthocyanins, total flavonoids, is actually associated with a slower progression of cognitive decline in older women. Um, with relatively small amounts of serves per week, and berries are still showing to be the most influential on lowering the risk of developing dementia in this and the other several population samples. So the small serves, like a two, uh, two, uh, two serves per week um, or more, or a one serve per week of strawberries and one serve uh, per week of blueberries, have actually shown to have a rapid cognitive decline. And we're talking about improvements or equivalent of being two and a half years of the younger. And therefore, the berries on their own, quite common now in the research, we are looking at them in their own development of this cognitive, uh, cognitive uh, risk score for the development of a dementia. Um, now, limitations. Um, when we talk, uh, I know that you guys will come back and say, but hang on a second, you know, these are the observational studies. Um, and, and, and yes, um, one of the limitations of observational studies is that these studies are observational. And the association between the two or several other parameters doesn't necessarily mean that there is a causation produced. Um, hence, for the cause and effect, we um, actually rely on a well-designed clinical trials. Um, and with these studies as well, we can look into the population uh, with a dysfunction uh, and a healthy population. And on this slide, you can actually see that um, there are both population samples. There are statistically beneficial health outcomes after the consumption of uh, a blueberry powders in this case. In this case, so in the in the upper in the upper table, um, in, in the individuals have been consuming. Um, they have actually been diagnosed with some sort of a chronic uh, dysfunction, whether they have got. Um, uh, whether they're at the early stages of developing the Alzheimer's or the dementia, or whether they're early stages of uh, any sort, any form of a cognitive dysfunction, you can actually see that consumption for a 12 to 26 weeks has actually shown the improvements, such as a memory travel, uh, downregulation of uh, memory uh, errors and forgetfulness. And in a healthy population, what is also important is that in this population sample, there is um, a, a, a retaining of some of the cognitive functioning during the consumption. So not necessarily that you have to look at the improvements in the cognitive function because they are already functioning normal, but as long as there's been shown that there is no decline or accelerated decline um, in, in obviously um, after the consumption of, of, uh, of the powders. So what is, uh, is, what is great or what 
what we can actually get as a great kick out of these studies is that, as we have mentioned earlier, the findings can be easily proposed as a benefit um, for the other berries rather than being strictly reserved for blueberries. Because with these type of studies, you, you also have to look at the composition overall rather than identifying and saying, aha, this is the one compound that is found in the blueberries or this is one that's not found anywhere else and has to be used. So we have to look at it more from the more holistic perspective of the berries rather than uh, looking at one individual item of the berry itself. Awesome. Blueberries are just well studied, I think, compared to the others as well. Um, so we've done the hard stuff, I think, um, in terms of addressing the science behind the gut brain benefits of berries. And now we get to do the fun stuff. Um, and we know that in practice, it is very useful to share culinary nutrition information uh, with your clients uh, to help them uh, meet their intake needs. And so we're going to go through now some tips on the culinary uses of berries. And I know we've had some questions about this already. So hopefully this answers some of them. Um, so Teresa, talk, talk to us about uh, cooking and doses uh, as well as benefits of eating berries. Yeah, it's interesting because um, we don't often think about cooking blueberries. I know I don't. I just sort of wash them and, and consume them. But um, cooking them in some extra virgin olive oil potentially improves the polyphenolic content. So it's something to bear in mind. And I, I did put together some interesting ideas about how we could uh, cook blueberries and what we could do with it. So we're going to talk about those as we go through. Um, but if you're not up for cooking blueberries, by all means, consume them raw. But the powdered drinks, which you often see in health food stores, can also be a, a benefit. Um, they do, the powdered drinks still contain all of the fibres that are necessary. So you can pop those powdered drinks in anything really, smoothies, um, cheesecakes, um, which is one of my favorite things to do. Um, and um, the powdered drinks, again, increase the bifidobacterium and that's been proven over a six week period. So consuming those berries whilst they're in season at the moment and extremely deep is something that we need to start encouraging our patients to do. There's about a 200 to a 400 milligram dose of polyphenols in 150 grams of fresh uh, blueberries. And that's generally how they're sold. They're sold in anywhere between um, 120 to 145 gram packages. So that's the average consumption on a daily basis. Um, and the time for benefit is about 90 days. So you really do need to, um, and I know that Nanad said that there's benefits even if you do it once a week, but um, if you do it consistently, if you're consuming them consistently over a period of 90 days, then you're going to see that increased benefit in the diversity of the gut. So different ways of consuming uh, the um, blueberry itself. I think uh, some of the things we want to look at are the oxygen radical absorbance uh, capacity or the antioxidant capacity of the blueberry. If they are better fresh or frozen. So don't worry about um, some people think that they lose their content, their anthocyanidin or polyphosphate fennel content when they're frozen, but that's not actually the case. It's still reasonably high. Um, powdered has similar ORAC to fresh or frozen blueberries, but they don't do so well if they're canned in syrup or pureed or juiced. So that's something to bear in mind as well. Um, and particularly if they're canned and left for more than a six month storage um, uh, so it's important to uh, think about how we're going to consume these strawberries, uh, the berries, sorry. Thank you. Nicole, take us through some uh, fun ways that we can be eating berries. Thanks, Emma. Um, well, I do agree with Teresa. I think, you know, we're so used to having them in a sweet way because they do have this, uh, these beautiful esters that you've been talking about. And so... Um, you know, smoothies and even pancakes or, you know, with yogurts or in 
puddings and that sort of thing. Um, but they really, I think, have such a great visual appeal as well that they can be added to um, other high fibre foods like cereals and whole grains, you know, nuts, vegetables, um, to try and encourage our clients to, you know, eat more of those high fibre foods generally across the board because we know, you know, there's not many people in the general population who are low in protein, but there's certainly a lot that are low in plants and fibre. So if the visual appeal of berries can help us eat more broadly, um, I think that's great. They perfectly pair with yogurt, like that's one of the ways that a lot of people enjoy them. But even adding them to savoury dishes, um, for example, you know, meat, chicken, fish, something like a raspberry balsamic glazed salmon um, or a little pop of freshness with your cheese platter, um, perhaps, you know, blueberry and rosemary roast chicken. You know, they're so versatile, you can pretty much put them with anything. I encourage everyone to experiment because the uh, possibilities are endless. Um, thank you, Nicole. Um, so we are running slightly behind time, but I do really want to pick your brains uh, very quickly on your clinical tips related to discussing berries with clients. Um, so Teresa, take us through your list. Yes, so um, one of my most um, interesting facts about the blueberries is that they, it, it depends how much you actually want to give a patient, whether or not um, it's going to affect anybody with a FODMAP issue. So we just need to follow the guidelines. And I think the most important thing is test it with your patient. So I did commence a patient on a very small, it was a patient that reacted to FODMAP foods. Um, and I started with a very low dose. So I think titrating dosage for your patients is really what we should be looking at. And if we start very low at perhaps a 25 gram intake and then work our way up to a 75 gram intake um, and just monitor those symptoms. So higher fiber doses can be tenuous, particularly for people who perhaps have um, gastric conditions but uh, titrating up is the best way to go. The powdered blueberries seem to be much better, better tolerated in people that have um, gastrointestinal conditions. Thank you. Nicole, you can extend on the FODMAPs for us. Yeah, so Monash um, with the FODMAP app have recently revised some of the levels. So Luckily for us, with berries, they've increased the amount that we can titrate up to, as Teresa was saying. Um, so now they recommend up to five medium strawberries, a cup of blueberries, a third of a cup of raspberries, or one small blackberry, the big boss. Um, and then if you've got anyone on a food chemical elimination diet, well, obviously berries are going to be quite high. Um, from a food chemical perspective because they're so high in polyphenols so they're rich in you know color and flavor um, so you know the bland and boring side of things is where we want people on those kind of diets so um, blueberries would be the lowest chemical out of all of those um, berries so it falls into the high column um, and the other berries fall into the very high column. So it would be a matter of really trying to personalise um, and experiment with your clients on that as well. Wonderful. Uh, so, Nenad, I know you're not working in clinical work, um, but from a research notes perspective, um, what do we need to think about in terms of limitations and moving forward with this research? Well, um, from the from the limitations, one of the you know in in a summary we have already identified that the berries are the richest and the most diverse source of polyphenols, and that polyphenols have got a number of different health benefits, um, and 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 health aspects associated with the higher consumption. Um, one some of the limitations that we have really not discussed. Uh, in the details, and and we can talk about for a weeks is that there are other berries. Uh, that um, we have not touched upon. So, for example, the native berries, 
uh, that we found in Australia has got uh, such a wide selection of indigenous plants and native plants that are still not available on a commercial market. And, and some of these uh, foods and some of these berries are found in a much more smaller quantities from the local growers. But they, in some cases, they contain um, along the lines of a seven to a 10 times more of the polyphenolic content that is found in, in the in the blueberries, for example. At the moment, we, we're doing the research on, um, although it's not a berry, but we are looking at the research in, uh, in a Davidson plum that actually has got a five times more of the polyphenolic content than the blueberries. So we are trying to develop a functional food product. So a number of different aspects to be considered for what has not been explored and what is a good limitation of this talk. Um, but we also have to look at uh, polyphenol combinations, a mix of different products and concomitant aspects that we can find from the consumption of the strawberries and the blueberries and the blackberries and some of the other food products as well. But also the bioavailability and the digestion issue for some of the polyphenols. There was a study only uh, relatively recently, and I'm trying to see exactly where these guys, because I have got an article just listed in here, um, that has actually been published uh, in the Food and Function Journal. And they have looked at the uh, impact of polyphenol oxidase on bioavailability of some of the flavanols in a fruit smoothies. And what I found out is that a combination of uh, uh, a, a blueberry smoothie or addition of a blueberry to a banana smoothie has drastically reduced the absorption of the flavanols um, in a circulatory system. So, you know, there's uh, so much of the things that have not been explored. And the findings of these studies definitely does not mean that you should avoid the banana or that you should avoid the blueberries. It's just that from the research perspective, we really have to be cautious as to how we're interpreting the findings and what kind of implications these findings might have. So in the other words, even that the studies like this have been shown that there's a potential for a lowering of the absorption, it's also important to observe that there are a number of different beneficial health effects that can actually be associated with the consumption of these type of fruits. Um, so yeah, that is, that is from me. Great. So as always, we study things in isolation, but they are written by people in combination. Um, Nana, to start the q and I'm going to ask you because I didn't ask you your culinary tips. And I know as well as being a food scientist, you are a trained chef. What's your favorite way to cook a mix of berries in together to diversify that berry intake? So the mix of berries. Okay. So one of my favorite things is to actually get a blueberry, strawberry, uh, and um, uh, blackberries and actually roast them. Uh, you crank up the oven to a 210, 220, uh, slice them up, put them onto the tray, crank them in the oven, heat them up, they will start sweating, they will start caramelizing. Once you roast them, what you're doing is you, the smell in the house is absolutely amazing. And if you want to sell your flat or sell your house, roast the berries, the people are going to buy it. So once they're roasted, you actually take them out and while they're still hot, you put them on a bit of a, a really light custard, not sweet and custard, you know, just a standard um, custard, put it over the top and then sprinkle or dust with a sumac. And a sumac is the actual spice, a Middle Eastern spice that has got that really tangy, a lemon tarty type of a taste and it really enhances the flavor it binds it all together and but before you eat it just grate some of the lemon rind over the top and Bob's your uncle, Fanny's your aunt. It's absolutely fantastic. I'm actually salivating right now just talking I'm about it. I'm really glad I asked that question and I'm going to be making that later today, I think. That sounds amazing. Um, <laughs> as did all of the, the different ways of eating berries that were mentioned. Um, so I'm going to go to um, some of our audience questions now. Um, Teresa, you mentioned um, that you would prefer to recommend organic where possible, but not um not necessarily possible or necessary for everyone. Um, do you think that... Um, it matters uh, a lot if people have organic or non-organic. Do, do we need to have people stressing about it? And do you think we need to see research separated between using organic and non-organic berries in the, the studies? I think we do need to see more research around it. But I know that um, many of my patients can't afford organic um, blueberries. But there was some an interesting research, uh, some Indian research in using uh, white vinegar and water as as something that we can soak our berries in for you know a minute two minutes that will get off most of the toxins on the um on the berries the berries are generally put into that category of the dirty dozen and i'm sure you've all heard about that so they are sprayed quite a lot um so it's a good idea if you can't afford organic to do that um, obviously, organic is preferable. Uh, the soil is um, 
generally in better health than any soil that we would use that uh, wasn't um, organic. So I think it's that's a two-edged sword. Um, I haven't seen any research on whether or not the polyphenol content is different. If that is the case, then obviously I would say go for the polyphenols. But if you can't do that, best best scenario is soak them with one cup of um, white vinegar and three cups of water, um, and that's the correct ratio. I love this as a tip because this actually will make your berries last longer as well because it's going to inhibit any fungal or bacterial growth um, on the outside of those berries. Uh, and it's also part of flavor enhancing. It's going to make them taste better as well. So I absolutely love that as a tip. Um, we are quite lucky in Australia that use of pesticides in ber the berry industry is minimal compared to uh, some other countries as well. Um, and I think it is also important to note that the, the washing is going to be part of removing those pesticides, but they're also pesticides that do break down with time and sunlight when they are used as a last resort as well. Um, so I think that's really important to mention. Nicole, we did have a couple of questions in the chat about uh, the low FODMAP diet um, and some people who just wanted some a little bit more elaboration real quick on uh, why those, those FODMAPs uh, might matter in people's diet when it comes to the gut health. You're on mute, Nicole. Sorry, I'll get it right <laughs> at the end of the webinar. Um, so in terms of the the fructo, fructans? Generally speaking, I think we yeah. just, for, for those who aren't across the low FODMAP diet, why might that be a concern? Oh, okay. Um, so because the, the, the FODMAPs are actually um, a lot of the prebiotics that we would, like, we would generally recommend people have in their diet to... Um, you know, try and feed the the live bacteria in the gut. So if we're cutting them out, and particularly if we're cutting them out long term, then we can end up starving. Um, you know, populations of the good bacteria in the gut. So, um, and we've definitely seen that in practice ourselves. We've had patients come in that have been on the low FODMAP diet for a two year period plus. Um, you know, in, in a worse state of affairs than what they were at the beginning. So it really is a short-term test diet. We don't want to be cutting out these foods long-term, which is why, you know, working with a practitioner is a good idea. Excellent. So we've had a couple of questions about uh, comparing our easier to access, more um, user-friendly Australian berries to our super berries, like our acai and those kinds of berries. Um, people complain that berries are expensive enough, uh, but those super berries are a lot more expensive. Can someone allay our fears and please reassure me and the rest of the audience that our approachable berries and affordable berries, and they are affordable right now, um, are also as good for you as those super berries? Who wants to take that? I think I'll take that one. <laughs> I think we get carried away with the new superfood. Um, I think if you go into NutTab, um, the Australian database, the uh, Food Standards Australian New Zealand, you'll find that uh, berries actually come very close to the super berries. There's not a lot of difference. So don't get carried away with the new and shiny. Um, the old is still good. <laughs> and familiarity is important, right, to get people using food uh, as the food first approach. If it's if it's new as well as um, difficult, it's not necessarily as easy to take up. Absolutely. Nana, do you want off mute? Did you have something you wanted to add? Uh, yes. Um, in, in regards to superfoods, I really like that concept about superfoods because there's nothing super about the superfoods. Um, they are foods, yeah. So I, I just want to uh, get that out from the research perspective. Um, you know, if you're um, if you're taking, it's it's a great to analyze the product and it's a great to come up and to say we have found a new version of a polyphenol found in uh, you know the blueberry or the acai berry or the berry that is grown in uh, long jungles of the Amazonian forest. That's all fantastic. But what does it mean from the overall food supply? And what does that mean from the overall food intake that we are seeing in the population? Yeah. So we really have to focus on to the foods that are available, that are currently available in the season, that are affordable, if we are going to see any beneficial health effects. And this is a nutritionist speaking enemy from the perspective of um, the blueberries currently, they are affordable, 
they are uh, are, there's a plenty of them we're getting into the season where there's going to be an absolute plethora of the blueberries hitting them up on the market use them have them now enjoy them when the winter comes when the blueberries are not in a season there are the frozen blueberries you can still focus on them and still have that polyphenolic content people quite often confuse that amount of polyphenols that have to be taken in in order to show the beneficial effects um there is uh, some evidence for that but I wouldn't be focused on that. I would be focused on a consistency as what uh, Teresa or uh, Nicole, you guys have mentioned in earlier talks, consume them over a prolonged period of a time and consume them on a regular basis. Um, the, the, the boost of a polyphenols or having the bombs of a polyphenols, it's not really going to benefit you if you're having it to one off um, and also accompany that with, with the appropriate dietary intake. So sorry, I, I got it off my chest. <laughs> We are very glad to have helped with that, Nanad. Um, So we are out of time today. Um, I do want to take a moment to thank uh, my three panellists, Teresa, Nanad and Nicole, for sharing your expertise and your joy and enthusiasm when it comes to eating berries. Uh, So thank you so much for your answers as well as the information you've shared today. I'd also like to thank my colleague, Yuta Wright, who has been behind the scenes putting this together today uh, so that we have been able to be front stage and sharing this information with you. Do look Food IQ Global up if you would like any more information about what we do. Uh, We also would like to let you know that we are hosting another webinar coming up um, that will be on citrus and I'll be addressing the superfoods problem again there. Um, So you can scan this QR code or hit screenshot now so that you can save that QR code or Google the details so that you can register for that one as well. Uh, So thank you so much for joining us today. We hope to see you in the future. And thank you again to the panelists.